And our, our speaker today is Navid, and I, I'd love for him to say a little bit more about his background and, and proceed with, with his presentation. Um, I'm Navid Kafar Zadegan. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, should we go around the table and each of us introduce themselves? Or? Sure, why not? Um, I'll, I'll start and then I'll just call on people briefly just to keep it organized. Uh, I'm Wayne Wakeland. I'm a professor of system science at Portland State University in Oregon. Ross? Hi, everyone. My name is Ross Williams. I'm a first year PhD student under the guidance of Dr. Hossein Michime at Virginia Tech. Robert. Bob Becker, uh, I have a startup called Humaginarium that's using system dynamics approach to uh, pay, uh, healthcare simulation for patients. And this is my first uh, meeting of this group. So I'm glad to be here. Welcome. John. Hi, John Anderson, Case Western University, Assam Professor. Constantinos. Uh, you're muted. Hi, I'm Costa Striantis. I'm Navid's uh, colleague at the uh, Department of Industrial Engineering at Virginia Tech. Uh, thank you for crash for letting me crash your party. So, I'll, uh, you're, you're you're more than welcome. Please join us whenever you can. Yeah, appreciate this. Thank you, <laughs> Deb. Hi, I'm Deb Polk, um, University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine. Um, MJ. I'm Mohamed Jalali, assistant professor at Harvard Medical. Christine. Buddy, my name is Christine Tang. I'm a graduate student at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in the Interdisciplinary System Dynamics Program, and my bachelor's is in industrial engineering. Great, welcome. Uh, Georgia. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Virginia Tech as well. And um, I'm working with Dr. Trent. Good to see you, uh, Jack. Hi, Jack Homer. Um, I'm an independent consultant in the Hudson Valley in New York. Hassam. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Hassam, I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. And Neosha. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Neosha. I am an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. It's great to see everybody. Please uh, go ahead and proceed, Naveed. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending. Let me share my screen one. And... I think you're sharing your. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <Okay. laughs> So this is a, a work that uh, is co-authored by uh, with um, Haji Rahmandal at MIT and Ran Shu in uh, University of Connecticut. And it uh, is um, conditionally accepted for publication in PLUS Computational Biology. Uh, the, uh, the topic of forecasting is, has been always an important topic in you know, different uh, societies and people have been caring about this issue for a very long time. And there, there are multiple reasons for that. There is a reason that people um, like to be smart about things that are coming in the future. Um, one of the main issues is about the policy implications of that. And we are ready for things that will happen in the future. We can make better decisions. So there is a need. There is a need uh, for a demand for um, having better forecasts, better estimations for future. And that's there. And researchers have been trying to address that issue. Um, on the other side, you know, on the other hand, you can say that, you know, with kind of having and looking at forecasts and how they have performed, you get a signal about how models are performing because usually models are used for forecasting and we can learn a lot from how uh, forecasting models um, have been performing over <clears> time. <throat> Pandemic forecasting has been one of those issues that, you know, people have been thinking about it. And there are, again, multiple reasons for why we have been trying to forecast that. The you know, implications are like when you want to do vaccination, who should get the vaccines first? You know, what are the implications of that for the future cases? Uh, 
how we, you know, how, how should we have our emergency measures in the society, different policies for social distancing, what capacity in hospitals should be ready, and um, that has many managerial and policy implications, or even personal decisions like, you know, when should we plan our weddings, and where, when um, should we have our next conference in person, and so on. So they are uh, really uh, important questions, they matter, but then you look and kind of think about, reflect on what happened, you see that people actually offered very different forecasts and they had serious implications in the in government decisions. There were models that actually predicted that they will have millions of deaths during the early month of the pandemic. And there were models that actually predicted that by May 2020, we will be done with the pandemic. That's the one that actually uh, our president referred to that a lot. Um, and you see that you know in both ends, we made um, wrong forecasts. So the research question is that what makes the COVID-19 model better predict long-term um, trends? You know, what makes a model a better uh, tool for forecasting? And how can we improve long-term forecasting? But let me start with this paper that uh, I noted that in uh, the Journal of PNAS, uh, Proceeding of National Academy of Sciences, uh, it kind of shows the frustrations that researchers have had with forecasting. So this paper claims that it just, it doesn't work, <laughs> so it says, you know, specific points of forecasting, but overall the tone of the paper says that just long-term forecasting with uh, in pandemic is um, kind of impossible. And, and the, the argument is interesting. So the argument is not that there is no data. The argument is that because of this strong reinforcing loop of infection that we have, um, also with that strong feedback loop, positive feedback loop, with a little bit of stochasticity at the beginning, you may end up totally different trends. So you may kind of ramp up very fast, or you know you may kind of wait and wait, and then uh, cases grow. So it is very hard to actually predict when we will have our cases. So other articles also came up, kind of um, resonating with the main claim of this paper. And you know, you look at this paper. Actually, they, 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 their approach was very interesting. So they kind of took uh, cases in Spain and used SIR-like model and to predict the number of cases. And they showed that you know you get a wide range of cases if you look at this. So they say, well, you know, with the, this big interval that you get for your future prediction, it just is not useful for policymakers to predict number of cases. That's the main point of this paper that came out in um, a leading journal in uh, science. And then, you know, you kind of say, well, you know, that point is, is important, but then you look carefully in this graph and you see that, well, active cases in Spain, in their model, it's reaching, what, 100 million people. So there is something wrong here, right? You know, how can you have 100 million active cases of COVID-19 in a model? It turns out that when you look at the equation, you see that they are violating conservation of mass, which is an important part of SIR models. Um, so maybe it is also about how good your model is. Maybe you know, we know that all models are wrong. We know that all SIR models are also wrong, but maybe some of them are useful for forecasting. So let's just revisit this question with a better model model that at least kind of um, is consistent with um, with uh, physics of transmission. This is what we know from a century ago. So this model is the famous ACIR model. It kind of gets back to um, 100 years ago. And we are pretty familiar with that. In our system dynamics classes, this is usually one of the assignments, um, or often actually the first assignment that people do. Uh, there are two ways of representing that. You can go with the equations on the left side or with the model on the right side. The basic idea is that if you get more infected cases, the probability of contact with infected increases, you will have more exposure. So you have the reinforcing loop. It continues until there is a saturation because uh, susceptible uh, people will deplete over time. So this was around for, has been around for a long time. It is actually, uh, you can use the analogy that this is like Newton's law in physics. So this model in epidemiology is like Newton's law in physics. So people really use that. It kind of captures the system. And you get at the end of the day, you get one or 
maybe two different types of behavior from this model. Uh, dominantly, you get the S-shaped curve in cumulative cases, or you know, if your um, reproductive number is below one, you just don't get the growth. So there are two types of behavior uh, from this model that you can get with different slopes, but it is technically the same. If you look at the active cases, you get that bell shaped curve. Um, there are many limitations to this model that um, we, we uh, kind of can list a few of them, like constant parameters that can change as a result of changing people's behavior. Uh, they, it doesn't differentiate documented versus undocumented cases, so it doesn't have testing dynamics built into it, and other many other limitations, but it has been uh, the source for many modelers. You look at the data in the United States, it is not a bell-shaped curve, but it is actually oscillation is seen number of cases that we have had in the United States. It's going ups and downs in terms of death, kind of a um, oscillatory behavior. Even testing is, has, a, has a pattern and that can influence how you are seeing the data. So overall, the data is not actually a regular S-shape or bell-shaped care. Uh, there's oscillatory pattern and then there's change in observation. Uh, kind of looks that, you know, if you're just trying to fit your data with a, a conventional ACIR model, you will eventually fail. If you look at data from different countries, actually you find that the same virus is showing different sorts of behaviors in different countries. The blue line is number of cases per um, million population. The red line is number of deaths per million population in different countries. In some countries you see multiple waves, in some countries you see mon one main wave, uh, India. So these are all first year of uh, the pandemic. In New Zealand, you see like a very good performance. The scales are different. So you find different types of behaviors. And, um, and the question is, you know, how can we deal with this um, issue? Our study design relies on this um, effort that has been going on in CDC. Uh, so in CDC, since April 2020, uh, they created a forecast hub and modelers were just um, kind of submitting their forecast about cases and death in the United States uh, during the next weeks. So there's a very good kind of repository of all forecasts that have been done uh, in the United States. And when you go to the website, you see something like this graph. So it just says that how each of these models, like these little models are predicting the cases and kind of the analysis of uh, how when you combine them, you know, you get your 95% uh, interval of their forecast. Probably one of the things that you meant you quickly see is that these are so different, so different forecasts, right? Um, so who is, who's doing a better job here? Uh, and there are also notes here that says, well, you know, we all know that we are not doing a good job in, in uh, intervals. We have been out of the interval for a while. But you know, people are continuing this and these are good modelers. I mean, you go to their documents, uh, very kind of leading modelers in Columbia University, in MIT, in uh, Johns Hopkins. They are all submitting their forecasts and this forecast hub is kind of combining them, offering the results. Uh, theoretically, there are arguments that if you look at the median forecast in these data set, you get a good information. So they are kind of uh, highlighting that median point Hopefully that will be useful for uh, people. What we did is that we kind of extracted all this forecast that exists in their uh, hub during the period of almost a year. So these are all weekly forecasts. We are doing it at the beginning of the week for the next one to 20 weeks ahead. And so all these models are submitting it. There we found 61 models in this um, hub that are forecasting deaths in different regions of the United States. So they are doing forecasts for different states or different regions in the United States. So you have 61 models, about 57 uh, locations for several times, you know, more than almost a year. And then in each forecast, they are doing it one to 20 weeks ahead. So you end up with like five, about half a million forecast data points that we gathered. We done, then we compared all of those numbers with what actually happened. So we can know what, how much error each model was making over all these periods for different regions and different time periods. So we studied 
those numbers and we study the reports and articles that came out of all these uh, models. So we kind of try to look carefully on what has happened. Our analysis in this paper has two steps. One is that we kind of look at model architectures of these models that are doing um, their forecasting job and compare that with forecast accuracy that they have offered. Second, we are uh, trying to learn from features that make models better models. And then we build our own very simple model that uh, kind of compare, then we compare its results with the hub. Uh, modeling categories that we recognize, you know, when we are looking at this, we soon came up to these categories that these models, these 61 models are either mechanistic compartmental models. That means that traditional SEIR like models, they have, you know, they may have more than just four uh, stocks. You may have more and more compartments about hospitalization and so on. That's one big group. Another big group is non-mechanistic models that actually are becoming more and more popular with machine learning, you know, and a different type of kind of um, artificial intelligence and regression models all are in this category. In this category, you are not uh, modeling how the disease spreads, but you are looking at the correlations and, and trying to predict the outcome. Then there was this category of ensemble models. These are groups that have multiple models and they are combining their results, usually offering the average of their outcomes from multiple models and, um, and reporting it on CDC COVID uh, website. There was also other category that, you know, we soon learned that this other category only includes two agent-based models. So it is technically the same as agent-based modeling. And we may argue that agent-based is also a kind of mechanistic model, but it is not compartmental. And then, you know, we look at all the documents that exist for those models. You know, we coded the architecture of these models in terms of the type of um, data that they get, you know, what type of variables they're using from outside. And then um, kind of what, what is the thing that they are predicting not all of them are predicting cases. Um, some of them are just predicting death because kind of more accurate data exists there. The time horizon of their predictions was analyzed. Then um, how the, their approach to estimate transmission intensity or reproduction number was something that we were really interested in. We coded based on uh, their documents. Some of them have consistent um, uh, transition intensity or consistent and uh, constant reproduction numbers. Some of them were modeling um, the way that uh, reproduction number changes over time or estimating it as a changing parameter. Another question was how are they estimating uh, transmission in intensity in the future? Are they modeling that again or then in future how are beta in kind of conventional ICR models are changing or we are assuming it to be constant based on the recent data. Are they doing scenario analysis? So there were also different approaches for how you are predicting future uh, transmission intensity. Uh, state resetting was something that was more about related to how they are calibrating before prediction. Are they uh, trying to kind of minimize the error that they see between their data and their simulation and then they project uh, their forecast, or they are just kind of running their model all endogenously to see how the future evolves. And how they are dealing with mod mobility, we looked at all those in these 61 models and other general information about um, the modeler's backgrounds. And then, you know, we looked at um, in each categories of the models, we try to find more details about, you know, if it is a mechanistic model, are they kind of having a simple SIR-like model or they have coupled structures, you know, different age structures? Do they have commute between regions? You know, there are models that kind of go into that level of details. There's a model that actually separates transmission of the disease at night with, uh, with daytime and um, the Columbia University model. And, and so on, you know, we can look at, we looked at all these uh, documented them, uh, non-mechanistic models, kind of the same procedure, you know, what is their, exactly their care fitting approach? What type of machine learning techniques they are using? Are they considering any impact from the weather? Ensemble models, you know, we looked at the type of models that are included in these ensemble models. 
So let me just show you the results of our first round of analysis. A few insights that we got was that, first of all, to our surprise, there weren't many agent-based models. You know, there's all these discussions out there that uh, ABM models are very useful, but at the end of the day, there were only uh, two models out of these 61 models that were ABM models. The main reason might be related to the fact that they are computationally expensive. So just to run um, a model for a region and then kind of combine all of that, get rid of all the stochasticity and report something useful, it will take you some time, which is um, kind of uh, not useful when you are offering a timely forecast in these websites. Another finding was that about 38% of these models were non-mechanistic, which is interesting. So kind of shows how machine learning and regression models are becoming more and more acceptable in this domain. But still about half of them were SIR-like models with different kind of um, changes in their structures. And um, in terms of parameter estimations, and, you know, there are all these new methods that are developed, but these models are using the simplest possible ways for model calibration. And um, for, uh, for, um, uh, for fitting simulation models with, with the historical data, they all kind of, the majority are coming with the conclusion that the reproductive number is not constant and it's not constant. So they were considering that otherwise they would fail in replicating the past. But as they were starting to forecast the future, because there is no data about the reproductive number in the future, they were just taking the majority, they're taking what existed at the time of forecast for the reproductive number. And they were just using that number, if it is one or if it is 1.1, they were using that number to forecast the future. So no change in the reproductive number or infected infection intensity for uh, when forecasting for the future. Modelers updated their models over time. That was a very interesting point that we were seeing. It, it kind of makes sense that they were also learning agents. You know, and people were kind of improving their models. And documentation of the models were kind of different, which was actually a difficulty for our research too. It just was making it kind of hard to compare the models. This is what you get from um, kind of comparing model structures on the mechanics, mechanistic side. You get these compartmental models that you can differentiate them based on their approach for calibration or fixing their simulation with data at the time of forecast. So we use this term state resetting, meaning that at the time of forecast, some of them are trying to minimize the error for short term by kind of getting the simulation close to the data, kind of um, a more sophisticated approach would be common filtering that you use uh, during your calibration and kind of combining simulation with the data to minimize the error. But there were also simpler um, techniques to do that. So in compartmental modeling, you have a group that is doing uh, state resetting. So kind of using data as an information to adjust their simulation with the data. And another group, a bigger group that was just simulating it to see you know, how the trends evolve and in smaller part agent-based models. So this is our mechanistic models. These are all non-mechanistic. These are ensemble. Let's look at the error that they are making. We are looking at the average error that each group is making, and we are comparing their average error with a model that we just came up with, uh, a very uh, simple model, okay, we call it constant model. As, as a baseline just to compare. So this constant model is a model that says, you know, whatever the case is today, or whatever death numbers are today, you're going to have the same number for 14 weeks. So that's like uh, assuming that everything will, be, will stay the same. So let's take that as a very naive constant model and compare that with the average of results that you get from each of these categories. Let's first compare the blue line with the red line. So blue is compartmental modeling with no state resetting. Red is a kind of machine learning type of modeling, non-mechanistic. You see that as we are going further, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, red ones are doing better. Non-mechanistic models are doing better, but then it switches and blue uh, and compartmental models perform better with less error than non-mechanistic models. Nevertheless, 
they are not that better than the constant model. Actually, in short term, they are worse than that. After a while, the average um, in, in compartmental model is better, but it's still not that much consistent. What is better than all of these is compartmental models that also do stage resetting and uh, kind of do a better job in calibration. They perform better over time. So this is something that we get by looking at the architecture of these models. There are other things that other insights that we get. We do you know, this analysis using different regression models to make sure that results are statistically meaningful. And there are other things that we get also you know, in terms of who is doing a better job and its model documentation is an indicator that if anybody is doing a better job and it wasn't. Um, academic models were not necessarily better than people who were doing their job from industry. They were like interesting insights that you would get as you look at each individual of these models. But these are the main things that uh, we learn. One is that in long-term projection, mechanistic models perform better than non-mechanistic models. So the models that can show the transmission of the disease, look at it, um, you know, what Barry Richmond would say, operational thinking in, in model building, that is uh, a factor that can help you. And then uh, capturing transmission rate is a good, uh, is a key to forecast. So most um, just use kind of time-based change for reproductive number. Only one model actually model this uh, as an endogenous uh, factor. That was the model that IHME later provided. IHME used to do care fitting, but you know, they learned that that's not a good model. They, they switched to uh, a compartmental model. In that compartmental model, they did a very good job. They were um, modeling uh, transmission intensity with a feedback loop that was more like a switching mechanism, but that was, that was very much helping them. We learned that the stage resetting is probably a good thing that uh, can decrease the noises. And um, a few of these models also include a uh, weather impact, a few of these and a, better, a few of better models in, in included the impact of weather in their uh, transmission forecast. So these are things that we learned, but these are still associations. So none of them are claiming anything causal, right? So we learned that it looks like architectures that had these features did a better job in forecasting, right? So there's, there's some sort of correlation. Now let's just pick these features, build a model that has only these features, nothing else, and see how that model does. So we only we, we build the simplest model possible intentionally, the most simple model possible that is SEIR. So it is a mechanistic compartmental only has behavioral feedback, one behavioral feedback, does state resetting in its simplest format and includes a weather impact. And, uh, we, we, and we intentionally leave out treatment, testing, disaggregation of uh, asymptomatic from symptomatic and all of those fantastic things that are very important in forecasting, but just we leave them out. In our estimation, we leave out, you know, uh, delays, you know, uh, I mean, predicting you know, impact of weather and, and all those things. We just try again to make um, calibration the simplest uh, calibration possible with the fewest uh, parameters to estimate, which I will show you which parameters are. So this is the simplest SEIR, the 100 year old model, and we add this feedback loop, right? So this is the feedback that we add. So by removing, looking at removing, you can estimate death rate because it's just multiplying infections, infection fatality rate, IFR to removing, you get death rate. So we build this feedback. And what this means is that as number of death increases, people perceive that there is some risk out there. They start doing social distancing, not going out there, which decreases transmission intensity. And similarly, you can say that as death declines, you will feel more relaxed, so we go out there, and then that transmission intensity increases. So it's a balancing loop. It can be our kind of social distancing reaction, or it can be our complacency as cases decline. So the only thing added to the traditional one that always assumed beta is constant is that as death increases, we start uh, going out less, which declines, decreases beta. As death declines, 
we go more outside, which increases beta. And that, that's how beta is formulated. This W here that you see is the impact of weather that comes from another paper that estimated uh, this effect. And with this formulation, we are adding two parameters to be estimated, that how much people are sensitive to recent death. So these are the parameters that we estimate through calibration. Beta naught, that transmission intensity, when there is, you know, at the starting point, you know, when, uh, when death is not influencing transmission. Patient zero arrival, that's just one point, you know, when should you start the model? IFR, what percentage are dying? Alpha and, and gamma are for this equation and time to adjust risk perception. Upward and downward might be different and you know, how, how quickly you relax your social distancing measures might be uh, different than how you uh, react to that. Stage resetting, if anybody has a kind of question about that, is, is more kind of the basic idea that before starting the projection, let's reset our infected and exposed. So if you have a simulation that says, Today, you know, we should have 100 deaths, but then data says that we had 120. We are adding that 20, so we are kind of shifting the simulation up. And then from that point, we are starting uh, our projection. So kind of shift, automatic shift, just to adjust at the time of prediction. And we will kind of check to see if that really helps or not. So it is, it is the cheapest and, and most intuitive way of doing um, this. And there are more sophisticated ways, but we didn't want to do that uh, to, um, to be a little bit fair comparison. This is kind of results that we get from this model. We are replicating all states, all regions in the United States, and then combining them to see how US is um, behaving. So if we just show a few examples of our prediction. So if you predict at this point, the blue line shows how our model overall predicts the base of the disease. If we forecast at this point, this blue line shows how the simple model predicts. If we forecast here, uh, this blue line shows how the model predicts. If we forecast here, then this is how it goes on. So these are just examples of few outcomes that we get after aggregating all state level forecasts. But let's just do a more systematic comparison. The blue line here is what you get, the best thing you can get from the ensemble of COVID-19 CDC, co uh, CDC hub. So if you combine all those 61 models, if you take um, the median estimation, which is argued theoretically to be the best estimation from all these models because it gets rid of all the noises in two extremes, you get the blue line in terms of error in these models. So as you move forward, like if you do a 20 week time horizon forecast, you get this much error from covid uh, hub of CDC. And this very simple model that we just showed offers this amount of error, which is much less than what you get from combining all those 61 models in COVID hub. So you get a much better performance with our model. And uh, we also test and relax a few features that this model had. For example, you know, what if we turn off the behavioral feedback loop? suddenly our errors jump here. So that behavioral feedback is very essential in offering good projections. What if we turn off uh, the effect of temperature to get to this one? So it is helping, um, but still the model will be better than what you get from CDC. And what if we get rid of the state resetting feature? The state resetting feature helps in short-term projection, but not in long-term projection. And that makes sense, you know, in short-term we are trying to uh, kind of move simulation to the data to minimize our kind of next few weeks projections. But in long term, if the model working well, that should work well. So this is what you get. And then we compare model performance with all these models that exist in that data set, which is um, you know, you know, kind of all listed here. Um, <laughs> in the paper, we remove the names because it turns out that reviewers are sensitive because many of them belong to some of these groups. Uh, our model's performance is this bold black line, and we are ranking all these models. So in like next week forecasting, our model comes up second. In two weeks forecasting, our model comes up still in top 10. And this is how it's going on. The reason that the numbers are declining is that some of the models actually gave up forecasting for more than four weeks, just 
they, they were getting two errors or they came to the conclusion that they shouldn't forecast for more than four weeks. But still, you know, the model was, was, was doing, our model is doing good. So, and, and, and let's remember that it's like the simplest possible model that you can have. We did a, another type of analysis. So that was ranking of the model, but you can look at the errors and compare that. The results are consistent. I don't want to go to the details, but, uh, but this simple model was doing pretty good in terms of different types of comparison. Like here, we are comparing the model like two kind of head-to-head -head comparison in each region and see which one is doing better. In, and our model is winning in like about 65% uh, of the uh, comparisons. Uh, the conclusion here is that uh, all models are wrong. Some SCR models are useful for forecasting. And such uh, useful models often represent physics of transmission, account for endogenous changes in behavior. And uh, impact of weather is, is helping if you consider that in your model. State resetting helps short term projections. And um, a very simple model that incorporates only these features and kind of does, does a very good job. Um, and there is there is a hope for epidemic forecasting, so we wouldn't give up on uh, this issue. Um, and let's let's go. Uh, so, yeah, I know a, a few things about long-term forecasting that mechanistic models uh, are, are are good, and you know having a model that feedback is feedback rich helps. A few kind of methodological point is that. Uh, so we, we intentionally use this huge data set. So the data set is not just COVID data set, right? It's a model data set, it's like those 61 models. But it is also very important to look at different regions. So we, we are using all possible regions in the United States, so 57 regions, because if you just focus on, on predicting one region and comparing it uh, with one model at one time, it is very easy to get to a wrong conclusion. And that was something that we learned throughout this analysis, that you should expand your sample in terms of regions, in terms of the time of predictions and kind of models that you're comparing with. Um, and uh, yeah, but you know, we, we accept that there are also limitations for this uh, project. You know, we have done this after the fact. So, now we, we have tried to offer a fair uh, comparison, but you know it is uh, to be fair, uh, we didn't compete with those models at the time of prediction. This uh, more uh, analysis that I've done uh, later. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Navid. That's super super interesting. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. While your presentation slides are up. If you have a question that refers to a specific slide, uh, let's immediately leave this up and go to those, but then later we'll take down the presentation so we can see each other for the final part of the discussion. So my suggestion is if you have your hand up and you want to ask a question that relates specifically to the slides, let's take those first. Please just speak up if you have such a question. That'll be easier than me trying to call on you or, or maybe to call on you. So I think the questions are more general. So Navid, why don't you go ahead and take the slide? We can always bring it back up and we can see each other and have our, have our dialogue. Oh, you mean it's, uh, Yeah, just go ahead and, and share. Yeah, yeah, unshare for right now. So we can kind of have just a, and, and now please go ahead now. And I know Ross, you had your hand up early on. So go ahead and take the first question. And uh, I think he was clapping. Uh, <laughs> yeah, clapping if anything, hesitant. Uh, uh, okay. No, awesome presentation, sincerely. So if someone else had their hand up, was it? Yeah, go ahead. I guess I'm not going to try to moderate. Let's just talk and see how it works. I, I guess, guess I'll that. start then. <laughs> I, I want, My question is, you actually had a lot of data to work with. Most of us are diving into situations where having that amount of data would be like a total luxury. What do, you, what, what do you think you do in the early part of the analysis before all the data has emerged that you can use to smarten things up? So, Wayne, it is important to note that when we are forecasting, like, you know, when we go back and forecast, um, let's say May 2020, 
I'm using it correctly. Uh, when we are forecasting at uh, on May 2020, we are not using any data that comes up in future. We are only using the data that was available before that. So we are not cheating in that, <laughs> that sense. Well, we I didn't are, mean cheating. I just I know, wanted... I know, but I think <laughs> that's something that you know we should we should clarify that we are doing a fair comparison. So we are using only and only we are using death and case data. We are not using anything else. So when we are doing the forecasting, we are using death and case data that is publicly available and is used by these modelers. These models are using more data than, than us. Actually, they are using mobility data. They are using you know, different sorts of data. We are using those two and, and weather impact. Uh, so everything that is available at the time of uh, prediction, we are using that. Great. Uh Alireza, go ahead. Uh, this is Alireza. Thanks, Navid, for the presentation. It was great. Um, I have a uh, first. I have a clarifying question. I was wondering if you have uh, calibrated your behavioral feedback loop, and then uh, did you consider it unique or uniform across the U.S.? Um, that, that's a very good question. So, uh, yes, I mean uh, we we calibrated uh, the. Uh, let me just share this uh, he, uh, so these are parameters that we are using for calibration so actually the feedback that we are adding it adds four parameters to our model so it adds this alpha and uh, gamma and also adds the time delay for changing perception so it adds uh, four parameters that are coming from that and the only other thing that we calibrate is IFR and, and uh, beta naught and patient uh, zero arrival. And it is, so we assume it is different for different regions and it is different. Uh, so you, you will see that some states are actually like Massachusetts can react very quickly to the state of the disease than some other states. So we have to calibrate it differently. We are currently working on an idea that we want to kind of further analyze this feedback loop. And the, the hypothesis is that the way that people are reacting is not just a function of their own state's death, but it can be also national death or states in neighborhood and all other things. So this feedback loop needs much more ex exploration to uh, establish. Great. Thanks. Sure. Jack, go ahead. Uh, very good presentation, Navid. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the weather effect, um, and and you'd made a comment at the end about how it's hard to know whether it's a weather effect or a holiday effect, you know, like uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, but but couldn't you tease that apart by looking at the different regions of the U.S. If if you looked at uh, you know the Northeast versus the Southwest, you'd get a sense of whether the weather if it's a weather effect or a holiday effect. Uh, oh yeah, that that's the question. You know, that, that's true. We haven't looked at that, uh, Jack. And um, you know, it, it, what we are using here is just the weather effect. Uh, we didn't use uh, holiday effect. Uh, what we have, so we, we wrote, you know, um, Ran, Hajir, and I, uh, with a few others, including MJ, wrote this paper that came out in Lancet uh, Planetary Health that takes all the weather data and humidity data and everything and looks at correlation with the cases. So they, the first draft of that paper actually came out before all these um, projections. So we use that function that we had there to as an input for, for weather impact. Um, but to give a few kind of intuition here is that I've, I've done the same analysis with just using the the kind of flu chair, like how flu comes and goes in different seasons. And that's almost as helpful as the most sophisticated analysis that we had. And that's actually what IHME does. They, they on that part, on the weather impact, they are using a very simple uh, kind of uh, KRV pattern for, for this entrance. So it, it is, on the it flu is weather impact. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they are using flu season. So you can replace this with just a simple kind of, uh, trend but your point Season, is a seasonal valid. effect a seasonal yeah. effect calibrated to the flu or That's informed true. by flu but but the, the point that you know can we differentiate the effect of temperature with holiday effect is i think is a very important point in in the u.s uh, 
so we have Thanksgiving very close to the time that you know blue can rise. So it is very hard to differentiate those, uh, and uh, we don't we don't do that anymore. But that's something you know. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the difference between indoors, outdoors, and and super spreader you know get-togethers. Yeah, uh, so, so that's I'm I'm just curious about it. Thank you. I was curious, is IHME the other one that did very well in your long-term projection? Yes. So I just guessed, it, but I, it sounds like they are the other team that was doing all the, everything right, basically. <laughs> and, and they are the one that actually did very bad at the beginning. <laughs> so uh -huh, exactly, yeah. That's they are the one that, you know, we're using this. Uh, so can you see it here? I can just make it. So <laughs> talking a little bit about kind of the politics of the issue. So this is IHME and this is IHME. So they are doing a very good job, but let's let's note that initially they had this care fitting model that was on the news and uh, President Trump was also referring to that a lot. And it was predicting that we'll be done by May, 2020. And it, after that, you know, we learned that, okay, it looks like a long-term issue. They changed their strategy to this so they moved from what was just absolute care fitting uh, with no uh, respect to the physics of transmission to a totally better model on the other side with a very good compartmental model, very well calibrated with all details, including a feedback loop. And that model turns out to be the best in this uh, group. So this, there are, you know, when you talk to people who have been contributing to this, they, they are, many of them are Fix, uh, fixated or they are fixed with the with their first model, the IHME model, and they all say, "Well, IHME was terrible." But then there was a next part of the story, and maybe the lesson for us as modelers is that you know we should a little bit calm down, just make sure that our model is doing good before going public, because that's reputation when it is affected, and it's very hard to actually uh, correct it. Absolutely. So Navid, I just wanted to check with uh, the, the issue of unreported cases. Did you, did you, is there, is there any way that uh, that issue came to your discussion and how, how that was accounted for? Oh, the difference between reported and unreported cases. Yeah, because we, I think we are all aware that there were a lot of unreported cases. The question is that how, if you were to account for that, how would that change the results that you, you observed and then also your own model I'm not sure if you were accounting for that or you were just basically calibrating that to reported, reported uh, cases. Yeah, so we are not considering that. And the reason is that we stayed with just projecting death. So we are not claiming that the number of cases that we see in our model is anywhere close to what cases are reported in any of these regions. We're just saying that we have developed a model that forecasts number of death. And with that, we are kind of uh, avoiding the issue of um, uh, documented versus undocumented cases based on the assumption that usually people who die from COVID-19 are also tested because testing is a process that you, you are more likely to do it with people who have more symptoms, who are kind of in, in a dangerous situation in a hospital. That's, uh, so we, we I, I know that, you know, we have missed many, um, COVID-related death, but this is still less likely to miss, to miss people who are dying from COVID-19 than the whole population that are getting um, the cases. In other words, the claim is that death data is much more accurate than case data. So we stayed with projecting uh, death. Okay, so just as a follow-up from that, so what, what it means is that uh, your focus was on death, and if you were to, if the purpose of the model were to inform policy, then the question would be, will you have changed your model structure to look at knowing that age and also comorbidities were basically very important in predicting get, uh, dying from COVID? Would the model structure change or you will still stick with the same model structure? I, I mean, the model structure, if you want to do a better forecast, it should improve. So here the point was that with just a few simple things, you can still do way better than models that have included all those things that you are mentioning. So all these models, you know, if you go to details of their documents, they are very extensive model. I mean, the Columbia University model that Jeff Sherman does, and he presented in System Dynamics Conference as a plenary speaker, you will see it 
it's so much detail and they are like fantastic ideas there but still with a simple model of three four stock with one behavioral loop you can you can beat that model thanks yeah, go ahead yeah thanks another question navi uh, so you were talking about the various correlations uh, what what features of the models correlated with good performance I was wondering about model size. You just mentioned the, the level of detail. I guess I have a some prior that would say that the more elements you try to stuff in the model, uh, the worse you'll actually do because you're not thinking so well. So did you look for that? Uh, we didn't look for that and probably, but probably that's the reason that our model is working. You know, that might be a reason that this our model is working well in this case. But your your point, which is coming from you know lots of experience, actually, is is making sense. And uh, you know, as we add more details, you have more parameters to take care of. You know, you have more parameters. You get much more degrees of freedom. The likelihood that you make any error or somewhere that is going to make a significant difference is just increases. All those things are yeah, there. Computationally, it becomes more expensive. And you know. my my thought was just that uh, you know IHME and and others who were uh, disaggregating like crazy in the early going, you know, every, well, certainly every state, every county or zip code, you know, that, that looked very impressive. Look, they're, they're aggregating, they're doing every zip code. And, and yet it was, it was not a good model. So, uh, you know, maybe we get distracted by all that disaggregation in, in the wrong direction. Uh, that, that, that's a very good point. And, and, you know, we are, we are also biased toward, uh, you know, system dynamics and we kind of, we appreciate the importance of dynamic complexity and that's not necessarily about adding more and more kind of details, right? You know, if you have a model that is going after all zip code and adding numbers, that doesn't mean that you have a complex model. <laughs> so sometimes people, you know, yeah. follow that path and they're not contributing to uh, dynamic complexity. But so, uh, Jack, just as a follow, uh, follow up to that, so how do you negotiate situations where they want to do targeted interventions or specific uh, basically policies, like in Singapore, when we're building the COVID model, we didn't build very detailed model, but there were a lot of pressure because they wanted to figure out if they should allow the kids to go to school and the older folks to limit them on their moving around. So there were a lot of issues that coming up. How do you negotiate some of these issues when you are trying to avoid building very detailed models? Yeah. So, John, I'm not saying that uh, uh, you should always build simple models. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying that. I'm saying that. No, I, I agree with your idea. I'm asking. The Jack, purpose of advice, modeling is very yeah, important. What advice you negotiating yeah. some of you? George and I yeah. once wrote that in a paper called "Small System Dynamics Models," and in the appendix we say that you know, in the end of the paper we say that many times when you build a model for stakeholders. Everybody in that meeting room wants to see themselves in that model. You know, yeah. Where is my box in that model? <laughs> and you have to represent them. So that makes it, you know, kind of move naturally toward more details. You know, and, and that's a kind of sometimes a limit to building, you know, small models. You know, at the end, many times you have to convince your stakeholders so they trust in your models. Uh, Deb, would you like, you ask a question in chat. I was wondering if you'd like to go ahead and grab the mic and go ahead and ask that question. Yes, but um, now that I've been sort of thinking about what everybody has been saying about simple models, I think maybe like, maybe you don't really need to take into consideration improvements in, in uh, medication. I was just thinking, since we're modeling death and that, you know, we didn't have treatments and then we did that sort of, you know, seemed important, but maybe it's really not. Actually, I think it is important. <laughs> so <laughs> what, you are, what you are saying is important. So here, the, the only, uh, you know, what, what we are trying to say is that this thing is important and this W is important and state resetting is important, but it doesn't say that other things are not important. So what you are describing is that this IFR has declined over time. And the reason for declining IFR is better health system performance. So our health system is learning. So probably with more removed, we have learned something which has decreased IFR, which has decreased death. Other things, you know, um, that, you know, other modelers in, the, in our community have looked at, like, you know, COVID fatigue is an issue. So with uh, decreasing contact rate, which is inherent here, people are getting also tired of all these staying at home, which is going to affect 
their risk perception and its elasticity to recent death. At some point, they will say, you know, I'm giving up, you know, let's, let's just uh, go out. You know, today we send our, our son to daycare, although we know that in their class they had uh, one case, you know, he wasn't considered as a close contact. But if it was a year ago, we wouldn't send him. <laughs> he would stay home. But you know, we, there is some sort of COVID fatigue. I have presentations. You know, I should, I should work. I can. Yeah. Other questions? Please feel free to chime in. And if not, I'm just going to once again thank Navid for a, a marvelous presentation, and. Um, I, I'll change the conversation to the next, uh, our next presentation for just a moment before we wrap up. Is there anybody here who has a, a suggestion or would themselves like to present uh, in May or June? I'd love to have you, you know, raise your hand and let us know. I can send an asynchronous email out to, with the same question, but if someone has a thought right now, I'd love to hear it. All right, well, we'll work that out later. I just wanted to give people an opportunity. I saw another hand or two go up. Uh, so please go ahead and, and uh, speak up. So this is Costas. I have, um, I have <clears throat> two people that I need to get in touch with that may, <clears throat> this group might be interested in presenting. Um, one of them is doing, um, one is COVID related. It has to do with mental, mental health and the spread of mental health um throughout the uh, actually the study was done in uh in london and i heard this presentation on monday actually and uh it's related to navid's uh, presentation in part because of the different modeling approaches that are that he talked about so but that's um that's my brother-in-law i'll have to ask him i don't know i don't want to put him on the spot so i'll ask him whether he wants to do that uh he's he's one of john sermon's uh, students uh, and uh, again um Alaska. Then there's another colleague that uh, <clears throat> that uh, is in Portugal. Uh, he's a retired faculty member in Portugal. He does risk analysis, and he uses a combination of, of system dynamics with systems engineering uh, to do risk analysis. And that'd be again. I'll, I'll have to ask to see if they're be willing to present, um, and when they might be willing to present. So those are two two ideas. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. If, when, you, when you learn, please please let Navid and myself know and we'll, we'll, we'll weave in the possibilities with them if it works out. And That'd if you great. want to add, add my email to your distribution list, feel free to do so. Okay, uh, do you? It's triantis.vt.edu. If you could post it in chat, I'll just copy it right out and we'll make sure, sure it gets onto the list. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Wayne, I, I had one thought about um, the next few months prior to the conference, it, it could be that, um, you know, people have presentations um, related to the papers they've submitted to our summer conference, but, you know, are, are shy about presenting them uh, because they're just sort of holding them in reserve for the conference. So I wonder how we should think about that. Well, you know, could, could presenting here be a nice warm up for the conference? Is that that allowed? <laughs> Any thoughts about that? I don't know, Paul, all thoughts. I, I'm kind of leaning towards why not, but I, I'd like to hear counter arguments if they exist. Well, I think we are about to go through the review process. So maybe when we finish, we can send you a list of papers and then we can contact the, uh, the, the what do you call it, the, uh, the authors and see if they would like to present to the group. That's a good thought. Yes. Thank you, John. Any other thoughts? Well, thank you very much, everyone. I think it's a good time for me to shut off the recording. I will do that. And uh,